So without further ado, I do want to introduce Dr. Aspina. She's a movement disorder neurologist in private practice. And she's also an assistant professor of clinical neurology at the University of Arizona. She earned her bachelor's degree at the University of California and her doctor of medicine degrees at St. George's University School of Medicine, as well as an MBA from University of Miami Herbert School of Business. She was a resident physician at University of Oklahoma Medical College, as well as Tulane School of Medicine, and she did her movement disorder fellows at LSU School of Medicine. During her career, she's been active in medical research, including participating in several NIH and pharmaceutical sponsored clinical trials, as well as serving as an investigator in the Parkinson's study group. So without further ado, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Espina. Great, thank you. It's nice to see everybody again. And so as Eden said, feel free to interrupt me during the talk uh, while we go through the slides. If you have any questions, you don't have to wait until the end. Uh, and then today we're gonna talk about off periods and how we treat them. <clears throat> so we'll get started here. Okay, and can everybody see my slides? Yep. It, you guys are seeing the slides? Yes. Okay. So we'll just start with, you know, how do we get Parkinson's disease and what happens in the disease of Parkinson's disease that gives us these motor complications? So remember what happens in PD is that these cells, these are these cells right over here that live here in the substantia nigra is called you know, sort of black substance because we see it's full of melanin. And for whatever reason, these cells start to die off. And we think that there's some combination of some genetic susceptibility. So there's a genetic mutation like LARC2 or GBA and some environmental toxin that turns that gene on that causes these cells to die off. And so here we see a normal patient. This is a patient right here where we see the substantia nigra. And then here's a patient who has cell loss. We can see that there's very few of these little neurons left. And this is what it looks like. It has a pale substantia nigra. And so by the time you get diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, 60% of these cells have already died off. So you've already had PD about 10 or 15 years, what we call the pre-motor stages of Parkinson's disease. And those are things like having constipation, having anosmia or losing your sense of smell, a history of anxiety and or depression. You can have restless legs and you can have RBD or REM sleep behavior disorder. And that can be present many years and sometimes decades before your diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And what REM sleep behavior behavior is, is that when you go to sleep and when you go to REM sleep, which is your dream sleep, usually you're paralyzed so that you don't act out your dreams. But in Parkinson's disease, that paralysis doesn't take place. So you're free to act out your dreams. So you can talk in your sleep, you can yell, you can scream, you can kick and punch because you're acting out your dreams. So usually the patient doesn't remember that in the morning. There's no reason to wake up the patient. RBD is usually more of a problem for the bed partner than for the patient because they're the ones who are getting woken up with the screams or getting kicked or punched um, at night. Um, but those are the pre-motor symptoms of PD before you are diagnosed by the neurologist with your motor symptoms of PD. So those are things like tremor, so resting tremor, although half of the patients never develop the typical resting tremor that you see in PD. They're sort of the akinetic rigid type. You can have rigidity or stiffness. You can have bradykinesia or slowness of movement and then trouble with gait and balance. And it, still the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is still made as a clinical diagnosis in the office. Um, the reason that your neurologist may order things like an MRI or lab work is to rule out other things that can mimic Parkinson's disease to make sure that you don't have a, a stroke here in the, in the brainstem causing those symptoms uh, or any lab abnormalities that could cause a tremor like thyroid problems, but it's still a clinical diagnosis. And that's why some patients, when they say, oh, you know, I saw my doctor, they had me walk down the hallway for two minutes and then they said that I had PD. You know, I don't know if I really believe that, but that's <laughs> exactly how we make the diagnosis. And then here, what this is, this is the famous little Lewy body that you hear about Lewy bodies. And so this is what the Lewy body is. This is what causes these little cells to die off. So what happens in Parkinson's disease, remember we talked about those genetic mutations. So those genetic mutations cause a protein called alpha-synuclein to misfold. And then when it's misfolded, it can't be taken out of, um, you know, can be cleaned up from the cells and they gum up the cells and they cause the cell to die. And so what the cell does, since it can't take it, 
they can't evacuate it. It puts it into a little garbage can and sticks it in there. And that's what we call the Lewy body. And that's what we see under the microscope uh, when we look at patients who, who've had Parkinson's disease. Uh, this is what their brains look like. So that's the, uh, the Lewy body that we see. And so for extra credit, the patients who saw the um, talk last month, they'll know, you know, what's the, what's the only mammal that we know of that has a pale substantia nigra that instead of looking like this lots of melanin here in the substantia nigra it's pale and um, people who know that you can put it in the chat but it's the three-toed sloth of south america so we remember this mammal is very slow it's bradykinetic it moves very slowly it only comes down from the tree once a week to have a bowel movement so they're constipated just like our PD patients and it turns out that they have a pale substantia nigra. So now when you use your trivia and you know that you know you go on jeopardy you can get your extra points. Now you you know a board question as well. Before and so, we move on Dr. Yeah. Espina, uh -huh. there is a question are there differences in the cells between hereditary and exposure? So no, not necessarily. And so there's more than one gene that causes PD and there's more than one toxin that causes PD. That's why we say as neurologists, if you've seen one Parkinson's patient, you've seen one Parkinson's patient because everybody has their own little particular flavor of PD as far as symptoms and their response to medications. So that's why when you go to your support group, if your friend is taking you know, XYZ cocktail of medicines that may or may not work for you. So the treatment for Parkinson's disease is very individualized. So everybody has a misfolded alpha synuclein. It's just a reason, a different reason why in the pathway, genetically why it misfolded uh, or what caused that misfolding. Um, but they all look like this under the microscope. And so <clears throat> we were talking before that, for you to be diagnosed and come into the neurologist office, 60% of those cells have already died off. So you're over here. So that means you still have 40% of those cells are still living. They're still producing dopamine and can, they can still absorb dopamine and use it for later. And so that's why when patients start medicine, like Cinemet, one tablet, three times a day, many times you could be late with that noon dose, even forget that noon dose and not even notice. But then after a couple of years, if you're late with your medicine, you notice that you're, you have these off periods. And if you take too much medicine, then you have this on time with dyskinesia. So what I was explaining to a patient the other day is think of it initially when you were first diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, you've got a savings account and a checking account. And your savings account is that dopamine, those dopamine producing cells that are still living, that 40%. And our job is to try to keep that savings account as long as possible. And that's why when you wear off, remember that your levodopa only has a half-life of 90 minutes. Uh, but initially you don't notice that because every time you go off, the overdraft comes out of your savings account and you don't notice it. But as you've used up that savings account, you know, after four or five years, and all of the dopamine is coming from your medication, then you notice those peaks and troughs because you notice the metabolism of the medicine. And when the medicine wears off, then you have those off periods. And so let's sort of um, describe what on and off is for patients who are newly diagnosed and they don't know the terminology. So on means that your medicine is working and your Parkinson's symptoms have improved. Your tremor is better, your rigidity is better, better, your balance is better. And then your off periods are when that medicine has worn off and your Parkinson's symptoms have come back. So you notice a tremor, rigidity, stiffness, and remember that you can have motor and non-motor symptoms as, uh, at the same time. So, and many times your non-motor symptoms will come back first. So many times patients will notice a numbness or tingling in the hand before the tremor comes back. Some patients can have a panic attack or anxiety before the motor symptoms come back. So it's important to recognize what your off symptoms are and what your non-motor symptoms are so that you recognize you're off and you take the next dose right when you're here. Because if you wait too long and you wait and you're like, you've troughed all the way down here, then you take your medicine, then it takes a really long time for that medicine to kick in and start working again. So our goal is to have you recognize your off periods and treat them right away so that we can spend more time in this therapeutic window where your symptoms are well controlled instead of bouncing up and down, up and down between your on and off periods. So any questions that you guys have? And also let's dispel another internet myth that 
many patients come into the clinic with, you know, sometimes they come in and they say, well, you know, I'm not sure if I want to start levodopa because I read on the internet that after a couple of years, it stops working. So it's not that you're levodopa. And what is levodopa? That levodopa turns into dopamine in the brain, exactly the same chemical that's missing. So it's not that levodopa stops working after a couple of years, is that you're not making enough of your own dopamine. And so we have to replace that dopamine with the medication. So that initially you started one tablet three times a day, and maybe five years later, you're way over here and you might be taking two tablets three or four times a day. So it's not that you've become tolerant or habituated to the medicine, is that we need to replace more of that dopamine because you've exhausted that savings account. And so that when you overdraft, when you have an off period, then there's nobody there to cover that and you notice those off symptoms. So what questions do you have about this graph? Well, you answered one question. Somebody asked, could you please relate interoceptive response or lack thereof to PD? And then yep, so I also, have, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. And then do all, do all patients present Lewy bodies? Mm -hmm. Yep, and then so every, you, go ahead. And then the last one is, will you have lower dopamine at night? Yeah, so your dopamine, it fluctuates throughout the day. So remember, your normal brain gives you a continuous infusion of dopamine throughout the 24 hour period. It doesn't pulse you with dopamine every three or four hours the way the medicine does. And it will fluctuate just like your insulin levels fluctuate depending whether you had a muffin for breakfast or orange juice or some oatmeal. And then the body decides I need X amount of units of of insulin. The same thing, if your body, you go to rock steady boxing or physical therapy, or you're stressed out, your body's going to produce more dopamine at that time. And then at, during the quiet time, like going to sleep, it's going to go down. Your need for dopamine is less and your production of dopamine will be less at that time. That's why taking oral medicines for PD causes so many problems because it has nothing to do with what you're doing, you know, your activities, and it has everything to do with how your gut is moving and whether the medicines are working or not. And then we'll, I think the next slide looks at delayed on. And then the other question was about the Lewy body. So everybody who has Parkinson's disease has Lewy bodies. And today we can do a skin biopsy uh, and we can tell very early on who has phosphorylated alpha synuclein, who's going to get these Lewy bodies. Um, so it helps us clarify the diagnosis in patients where it's a little bit unclear. Um, so sometimes you'll notice uh, patients will get a skin biopsy too. Uh, it's not that common right now, but it's all it's now available. So you know why do you have a delayed on or a lack of response uh, to medication? So remember that in Parkinson's disease you have bradykinesia or slowness of movement, and that translates to all of the muscles of the body. All of the muscles of the body have slowness, including the muscles of the gut. So it's the reason why our PD patients have constipation. So as that stool moves through the GI tract, through that colon, more fluid gets sucked out of the stool, the stool gets hard and you get constipated. And then once you're constipated, that gastrocolic reflex doesn't work and everything gets sort of stuck in the stomach. Because usually what happens when you eat, uh, your stomach gets full of the food, it starts to get churning and digesting, and then the stomach sends a message to the large intestine saying, hey, I'm digesting this food and we're going to move it down to the small intestine where it needs to be absorbed and we need to move everything forward. But if you're constipated, then that message doesn't get sent and everything sits in the stomach longer than it should so that it can stay there an hour or two longer. And then remember, both the food and your medicine don't get absorbed in the stomach, they actually get absorbed in the small intestine. And so if they're stuck here, that's why a patient notices a a lack of response. I took my pills and nothing happened. Nothing happened because uh, look at what happened to the pill. It's sitting in the stomach. It's completely intact. It looks like it's brand new uh, because it's not being absorbed. And so it needs to transition from the stomach into the small intestine to actually get absorbed. And so that's why patients notice a, what we call a delayed on. Uh, because everything got stuck in the stomach. And so that's why your neurologist is always sort of 
very aggressive in treating your constipation because we know the better treated your constipation, the better this GI tract is moving and the better it moves, the more efficiently those pills are gonna be absorbed. And still 90% of our medications for Parkinson's disease are still oral medicines. And so if they get stuck in the stomach, we're not getting very good use of them. And we'll see later on why all of the rescue medicines all bypass the gut to treat those off periods. So that's why you could have a lack of response is a delayed on because you have gastroparesis or a slowed gut. So we talked about on and off. So on means when your medication is working, your PD symptoms are well controlled. Off is when your P PD symptoms have returned, even though you've been taking your medicine as directed. So that you took your medicine at eight, 12, four and eight, but you had a big hamburger or a large meal uh, at 12 and you had a delayed on it. Everything got stuck in the stomach. There was competition with the protein in your food, and you notice that as a delayed on or a lack of response. And remember that your off periods are not just motor symptoms, but they can be the non-motor symptoms too. So let's talk about those. So your motor symptoms is what the neurologist uses to make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. So you can have rigidity, which is worse on one side than the other. You can have bradykinesia or slowness of movement, which is worse on one side than the other. And that's why the doctor's always having you do this as we're looking for a bradykinesia. You have slowness of movement, so problems with gait and balance, problems making a turn. That's why we have you walk down the hallway. Soft speech, so some hypophonia or kind of a whispery speech. You can have trouble swallowing and difficulty with fine motor movements. But during your off periods, before these non-motor symptoms happen, like the muscle cramps, many patients wake up first thing in the morning with dystonia or cramping in the foot, where the big toe goes up, the other toes curl under and it, the toe turn and the foot turns in. And that's your gas gauge saying, hey, my gas tank is empty. But many times before those motor symptoms come up, you have non-motor symptoms. So patients can have a lot of fatigue, they can have anxiety. I had a patient yesterday who her off period was a panic attack. She actually ended up in the ER because she didn't really understand what that was. Uh, changes in mood, so you can have some depression. And just like you can have bradykinesia, which means slowness of movement, you can have bradyphrenia, slowness of thinking. You can have restlessness, like you just feel out of sorts in your body, and you can have pain. And pain can come from neuropathy, that numbness or tingling in the hand or foot, or from the dystonia, the cramping in the foot. So any questions about motor on and off? There was a question. Um, having said that early signs of the off, that it's important to recognize when you're starting to go off, do you have any suggestions of non-invasive devices to be used when you recognize that you're going off? Yep. So we're going to talk about all three of the Parkinson's medicines that are available to treat your off that are not invasive like Duopa or DBS. Um, and so it's important to recognize your off periods. So especially, so let's, you know, think of your levodopa like gas in the car. So if you drive your car at 80 miles an hour, it's going to use up more gas than if you drive at 50 miles an hour. And that's why you notice that every day is different. Some days your medicines last three to four hours, and some days they only last two to three hours. And that's because you're burning through it faster depending on what you're doing that day. So if you went to rock steady boxing, you went to physical therapy, you had a very stressful day for whatever reason, you're gonna burn through that levodopa faster. And so that's why we wanna recognize the off right here, because if you, and so let's say you're on eight, 12, four and eight, but you went to rock steady boxing and you burn through your levodopa and at 11, you started to wear off, but you're like, oh no, you know, my schedule is eight, 12, four and eight. I'm gonna wait until 12 to take my next dose. That means you're gonna fall all the way down here at 12 o'clock. That gut has slowed down. So you take the pill here. Now it's gonna take another hour or two to get back onto the on position because that pill, just like we saw in the picture, got stuck in the stomach and it takes longer to kick back in. So remember, we're treating the body, not the clock. The clock doesn't have Parkinson's disease, the body does. And so we wanna recognize your off as soon as you have it so that we can treat it that, at that time and keep you in this therapeutic window as much as possible and avoid these peaks and troughs that you have throughout the day. So it's the reason why your doctor will choose once a day medicines if we can get our hands on them or longer acting forms of medicine like Ritari so that we don't have to bounce up and down from here. And that if you end up here, that we can take one of the rescue medicines to get you back up to the therapeutic faster than using an oral pill. 
So what's the most common uh, off is called end of dose wearing off. So it's the most common reason why your doctor ends up increasing your dose of medicine. Why you're going from Cinemat one tablet three times a day to Cinemat one tablet four times a day, where you notice you come into the office and you say, gosh, you know, I noticed that my medicine is not lasting as long as it used to, that be 30 or 40 minutes before my next dose, I feel my off, whether I feel like I have the willies, like I have anxiety, or my tremor comes back. So that's called end of dose wearing off. Remember, that's your overdraft. You're no longer having enough dopamine cells to buffer that cinnamon and use it for later. So whenever it's metabolized, you notice the off. And so that's why your doctor has to add in another dose to make up for that, put more money into your checking account. So it's the reason why they increase your medicines is end of dose wearing off, just one of the most common ones. Then we talked about the delayed on where your pill gets stuck in the stomach. And that's why we don't wanna to wait too long once you notice your off symptoms to take your pill if you're taking oral medicines, because we know it's gonna get stuck in the stomach and it only absorbs here in the small intestine. And we know that that um, on can be delayed by having a protein rich meal which will compete with levodopa for absorption in this amino acid transporter so think of it like there's a little elevator here in the small intestine that takes your levodopa or your amino acids the things that make protein up into the brain and if your hamburger got there first then it goes into the elevator first and goes up to the brain first, and then your cinnamets waiting and waiting for the next elevator. So that's why we always want to want your cinnamet first. That's why the doctor will say, well, take your medicine first and then eat something 30 or 40 minutes later. So it gets into the elevator uh, first in line. And then as we talked about, we know that the constipation, if this colon is full of stool, that gastrocolic reflex doesn't work. And so everything gets stuck there and takes longer. So instead of migrating from the stomach into the small intestine in 30 minutes, it may be an hour and a half. Like this, this is a, a picture taken an hour and a half after the patient took the medication. So that's what it looks like. And so morning off. So patients, you know, take medicines throughout the day. They're getting good levels of dopamine throughout the day. And then you go to sleep and you don't take any medicine. And then when you wake up in the next morning, your gas gauge is empty. There isn't any gas in the tank. So your doctor will either use once a day medicine so that we can have coverage during the day and at night, or maybe add a dose of medicine in the middle of the night. So a dose of Ritari, a longer acting form of levodopa, or we may use a rescue medicine or on-demand therapy first thing in the morning with your first dose of oral medicines to get you back up and running as quickly as possible. And I think that now in the now that we have all of these medicines, you know, patients get so used to having bradykinesia or slowness of movement that for the last 10 years, it's taken them forever to get dressed in the morning, get ready in the morning. It's a two hour process. And so when you guys come into the office and we say, well, how are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm fine. Everything's fine. It's working fine. Uh, but if we ask you, uh, how long does it take to get ready? Or I asked a patient the other day, you know, is there anything that you're not able to do now that you want to do? And he said, well, you know, they moved my rock steady boxing class from two in the afternoon to 10 in the morning. And I can't go anymore because I don't defrost until 11 in the morning. And I'm like, well, you're not fine. And he was a patient who had come in and said, everything's great. I'm doing great. I don't need any changes in my medicine. But that's because he just got used to the new normal that it takes forever to get dressed in the morning. And I said, well, you know what? You don't have to wait until 11 in the morning to defrost. We can get you up and running earlier so that you can make your rock steady uh, boxing class. So I think you guys, I want you to go and complain more in your doctor's office and not say I'm fine, uh, because if you say you're fine, we're not going to change your medicines. Remember, the medicines in Parkinson's disease are purely symptomatic. They don't stop or reverse the disease. So we always want to make sure that the benefits of the medicine outweigh the side effects of the medicine. And as we know, the side effects of PD medicine can be quite significant because Although they make the motor symptoms of your Parkinson's better, like tremor and rigidity, they make your non-motor symptoms of PD worse. They lower your blood pressure, which can make you dizzy, can make you faint and fall. They can make you nauseous. It can make you confused. It can make you hallucinate or compulsive. And so your neurologist is never going to increase the medicine if they don't need to. We're always very conservative with the medicine because of the side effect profile. So if you don't complain, we're not going to change your medicines. But if you come in and you say, hey, you know, 
I'd like to go to my rock steady boxing and it's at 10 o'clock and it takes me too long to get ready. There's many options that we'll talk about later on that uh, can help you get ready. So we have lots of good medicine. So when you go into your doctor's office, please complain. Wait, then I have we a couple have, of questions. Oh, go ahead. Um, one, what happens to the medication that's not absorbed? So it'll just go through the stool. So it'll be absorbed, but it might happen late. So what happens, you know, let's say you're here, here's the patient. And then, you know, they took their dose at 12, you know, at two o'clock, this pill is still sitting here. What happens? The patient takes another dose and then, then they end up here. They end up peak dose. Then they peak too high above the therapeutic window and they have on time with dyskinesia. So their symptoms of rigidity and slowness are better, but now they have involuntary movements and they have dyskinesia or wiggly movements. And we'll see a, a video of what dyskinesia looks like. So that's what happens. It'll get absorbed, but it depends when in that cycle it gets absorbed. And if it gets absorbed at the same time as your other dose, then that's how we get this peak dose dyskinesia. Um, so, or it could just go through the system unabsorbed, but usually you end up here. So, and our goal, even though patients prefer to be here to have on time with dyskinesia because they're a little bit looser, it's not as painful as being here in the off position. You know, the dyskinetic movements can be not only embarrassing, but it, it's a reason why your PD patients lose weight. They're always burning off those calories. It can be very uncomfortable. And it's a reason why our patients become socially isolated because if you're very dyskinetic, so if you're moving around in your chair, you're not gonna go out to dinner. You're not gonna go sit in a movie theater. You're not gonna go sit in the middle seat of Southwest Airlines if you're wiggling for the whole two hours to go to you know, see your grandkids. So we wanna avoid this dyskinesia as much as possible so that patients don't become socially isolated and, not, and decide not to do stuff uh, because they never know like when the pill's gonna kick in, how long it's gonna last and whether they're gonna be dyskinetic and is that gonna last four or five hours or only one hour. The same thing with the off periods. You know, patients are less likely to do stuff if they're always planning their day around the six or seven doses of levodopa during the day. And so if you're always planning your day around those doses of levodopa and when you're going to eat and what you're going to eat and when you're going to go to Costco and that sort of thing. And then eventually you're like, you know what, I'm just not going to go play golf with my buddies. I'm not going to go out to brunch with my friends because it's just too complicated. So our goal is to keep your life as predictable as possible, divorce you from the six alarms on your clock, on your smartphone, and just let you start your day and not worry about these peaks and troughs that you have. Uh, during the day. So that's why we sort of change your medicines. Question also questions? about, uh -huh. since you did ask about the smartphone, do you have any comment on the smartwatch or device to detect the off time earlier than any symptoms that show up? Yeah, so right now the those smartwatches like your Apple watch, they detect tremor. So, so most patients can detect tremor uh, as, as soon as it comes. So what we really need to, to get you to learn is to learn your non-motor symptoms of off uh, because those happen first and they're not picked up by the smartwatches or these wearables. Um, and then as soon as you feel the willies, like I feel restless inside, I have an inside tremor or I have anxiety before the rigidity or the tremor comes up that is picked up by the wearable watch, then we're a little bit ahead of the game and that you're not having so many periods of off or it's easier for you to take the on-demand therapy. So those are good, but most patients, by the time the watch picks up that you have tremor, you already know you have tremor. So the key is to pick up your non-motor symptoms of off and that clues you in faster. And so your trough is not as deep, especially here with unpredictable off. So remember how we talked about levodopa, it's like gas in the car. And that's why sometimes your gas lasts longer than others. So did you drive to, you know, Gilbert or did you just drive to, you know, downtown Phoenix? Um, so if you go to Rocksteady Boxing or any in physical therapy, and remember that Parkinson's disease is the poster child for the mind-body connection. So everything that you're thinking, feeling gets reflected in the Parkinson's disease. And so it's not only motor symptoms, like you're doing physical exercise that burns through that levodopa is emotional stress also burns your through your levodopa. So if it's tax time and you're trying to get your taxes done or your kids getting a divorce, you're gonna notice 
that your medicine doesn't last as long or that you're watching an exciting movie like Top Gun and so you, you notice a little bit more tremor or dyskinesia during those times. So that's when you have unpredictable offs that you took your dose, your dose usually lasts the four hours, but you did a lot of physical exercise and you wore off early. So that's a good time to take one of the on-demand therapies. So how do we treat your off periods? So as we said, we use once a day medicines to mitigate the effects of that gastroparesis, that slowed gut, so that we only have to make that transition from the stomach into the small intestine once a day instead of every three or four times a day. So it's the reason why, so it's not that your doctor wants to pick the most expensive drug at CVS, it's that we're trying to pick the drug that works more like the normal brain uh, so that you have less fluctuations during the day. So if patients run dopamine agonist, so dopamine agonist, so remember, levodopa turns into dopamine in the brain. Dopamine agonists go and sit on the same receptors as dopamine, but they're chemically not the same chemical. They do the same job, but they're a different chemistry. Um, and so those are Mirapex, Requip, and Nupro, where the generic names are Primapexil, Ropinrol, or Reticotine. And so we'll switch you from the three times a day medicine to the ones that you just take at night. So primapexil ER or ropinurol XL. And Nupro is good because it's a patch. It already bypasses the gut. It's going through the skin and it's a 24 hour medicine so that we can use it to treat your symptoms not only during the day, but also at night. Then we can use MAOB inhibitors. So those are medicines as your levodopa turns into dopamine in the brain, then it inhibits the metabolism of dopamine in the brain so it lasts longer. And that's what MAOB inhibitors do. So rosagiline or azelect is very common and zodago or safinamide is also a once a day uh, and they'll be inhibitor. And so your doctor may use some of those. Then we use other medicines. So on Gentis, oropicopone is a COMPT inhibitor, kind of like rosagiline. So instead of what Ongentis does is it inhibits the metabolism of levodopa in the periphery or the gut so that more of it, make it makes it from the periphery or the gut, you know, it crosses the blood-brain barrier and makes it up into the brain so that medicines like Azelec or Rosagiline can work better. So we inhibit the metabolism of your levodopa in the periphery or the gut, so more of it makes it up into the brain. Gocovery is a form of a once-a-day amantadine. So amantadine is a very old drug. It's actually a, a drug that was formulated for the flu, and we don't know exactly how it works in Parkinson's disease. And But Gocovery is a once-a-day version of amantadine, and it helps us not only with the dyskinetic or wiggly movements, but also with your off periods. And then Nurians is a super interesting drug. So all of these other drugs, they all work in the dopamine dopamine system and think of the, your dopamine like gas in the car. Like we said, that's gas, that's the go in the car. Norian's actually works on the brakes of the system, on the bradykinesia, the slowness of movement. And so it inhibits the brake. So think of it, even though you've run out of gas, if we give you Norian's, then we take the handbrake off the car and the car can still coast down the highway, even though it doesn't have any gas because we've taken the handbrake off the gas. And so that's how Norian's works. And so that's also a once a day medicine. All of these are once a day medicines and that way we don't have to fight that gut and it doesn't matter so much what you ate, when you ate it. Uh, and it's easy to remember to take something once a day. As you know, that's why you guys have those all those alarms on your smartphone because it's hard to remember every two or three hours to take medicine. So we like to switch you to once a day medicines if we can. So any questions about the medicines? Is it okay to take Tylenol or Advil with these? Yep, you can take Tylenol or Advil with these. The rosagilines and sedagos, your MAOB inhibitors, there are some contraindications uh, with uh, some medicine so that you always wanna tell your doctor what medicines that you're on and make sure that there's no contraindication with those. Okay, and then also, do you have any recommendations about crushing cinnamon in water to help with absorption? Yeah, so you can crush your uh, cinnamon in water. You can, if you're on Ritar, you can open the capsule and put that in a spoonful of yogurt or applesauce and take it that way. And so if you crush your levodopa or cinnamon and take it with a carbonated beverage, it's gonna absorb faster. And if you take it with something like milk, then it's gonna slow down the absorption and therefore you're not gonna get as dyskinetic. So in the past, before we had the pumps, 
um, then we would make this cocktail of, you know, liquid cinnamon with some vitamin C and people would sip it all day long. I mean, today we have much better uh, things. So we don't have to sip cinnamon uh, and uh, with vitamin C anymore. Are these so medications then, substitutes to Ritori and cinnamon? No, so these medicines are not substitutes. They would be additions to your levodopa. So levodopa is still the gold standard in Parkinson's disease because it's the medicine that's turning into dopamine in the brain, exactly the same chemical that's missing. What all of these other medicines do is they help that levodopa last longer. They're like helper ones, adjuncts that we call them. And it helps us take less levodopa during the day and makes it last longer. So they would all be in addition to your levodopa. Although some patients can start you know, off just taking rosagiline by itself or taking dopamine agonist by itself and then levodopa is added to it afterwards. And so we use longer acting forms of levodopa. So Ritari is a longer acting form of levodopa. So it's basically a capsule and it has a third of it is immediate release beads and then the other two thirds is extended release beads. So these little beads are gonna hang out in the small intestine and be absorbed over a longer period of time. And so it's gonna last longer. And so when we switch pa pa patients over from Cinemet to Ritari, we always tell them it's, we're not gonna decrease the number of pills that you take during the day. We're gonna decrease the number of times that you're gonna be taking levodopa during the day. So because it's not a one-to-one -one conversion, so three of these capsules equals one centimet, many times you might end up on more capsules, but it'll be less times during the day. And the Ritari should last four to five hours instead of just sort of the one to three hours that the Cinemet does. So it's a good option for patients that's gonna last longer. And then we have four different doses. And the other nice thing is that it comes in a capsule. So patients who have trouble swallowing like big pills, like Stilevo pills, then we can open this little capsule up, put it into a spoonful of yogurt or applesauce and take it that way. Remember, you don't want to just dump it into your yogurt because then you have to take, eat that whole yogurt to get the dough. So always put it in a spoonful and that we are, we're making sure that you get the dose. And then next year, right now, there's a newer version of Ritari in the pipeline waiting to be approved by the FDA. So it's IPX203 and it's a longer acting form of Ritari. So we should get six to eight hours uh, out of that medicine. And if we're lucky that will be approved by this time next year, that should be uh, available in the, in the clinics and that we could have an even longer form of levodopa. So think of it, you know, before for type one diabetics, we had the sliding scale insulin. They were always doing their finger sticks and figuring out how much insulin they would have to take. And then we had Humalog, a longer acting form of levodopa. And then we had the insulin pump. And so the same thing is happening in Parkinson's. These are sort of the longer acting levodopas like Humalog, and then we'll have the pumps. So IPX203 should come out next year. And then there's Duopa. So here it's taken us 50 years to figure out how to make levodopa into sort of a gel form. So instead of having to make that mixture of liquid levodopa with vitamin C and sipping it all day long, now we can use a pump um, to deliver the medicine. And so here's the pump. It's a little bit big and wieldy. Uh, and here's the cassette where the levodopa, the Duopa enteral suspension, suspension. These little uh, cassettes, you keep them in the fridge and then you use one or two of them a day and then you connect it. And then this is the PEG-J. Remember how we said that the levodopa gets absorbed into the small intestine? So this way it has a little pigtail and it's always first in line in that little amino acid transporter to be, to be absorbed. So we don't have to worry so much of what you ate, when you ate it, if you're constipated or not, because a little pigtail is putting your levodopa right into the small intestine where it needs to be absorbed. And the pump delivers a dose of levodopa every 57 seconds. So we have much more control over your medication than we do with a pill. So even if you take a pill like Ritari, we never know when it's gonna kick in or how long it's gonna last. And if you become dyskinetic, we have to wait the four or five hours for that pill to be metabolized for the dyskinesia to go away. With the pump, if you become dyskinetic, we can turn the continuous rate down, we can turn the pump off, and then once the pump is off, 20 minutes later, that dyskinesia is all gone. 
If for some reason you had some trouble with, you had a big meal and you didn't notice a little bit of difficulty with absorption, then there's an extra dose button already programmed into this pump, like an uh, on-demand therapy. And then you just add a little extra dose with your hamburger and then you're again, first in line. And so you have a much smoother absorption of the medication and we have much more control of the medicine using a pump than using oral medicines. So it gives us much more control and that way it can give patients a lot more predictability in their day. For patients who are taking the medicine five, six, seven, eight times a day, you know, they're always planning their day around their medicine. Once they go on the pump, you just turn it on in the morning, turn it off at night and you're not planning your day around your alarms on your clock. And sort of like, this is what it looks like. Here's the pouch that you keep it in. Here's the peg J. There is other tubes that we can use that are lower profile. So it's just a little, it doesn't have all this stuff hanging out, but that's how it'd be. And then the other nice thing about Duop was that it's reversible. So unlike DBS, once we put your stimulators in, we're never gonna take them out. This is reversible. So next year, there'll be new pumps coming out that don't need this peg J. We can just pull the tube, the stoma closes. You'll just have a second little belly button. And then we move on to the new pump. So it's reversible uh, and it's very easy to use. And you just flush it every day with some regular water to keep this tube patent. And so as we see, like remember how we saw those peaks and troughs, peaks and troughs before with the oral medicines? This is what the dis, you know, distribution or what it looks like to be on a pump, that you have a peak. So in the morning, you get a morning bolus to get on, and then you go on your continuous dose, and you see that there's very little fluctuations throughout the day until you turn it off, and so that you're more likely to stay in that therapeutic window if you're on a pump than if you're taking oral medicines and peaking and troughing above and below your therapeutic window. And then at night, we can either run it 24 hours a day or we can give you a dose of Ritari to get you through the night. Any questions about that? We have a few questions. Uh -huh. The first being, why not insert the tube into the intestine instead of the stomach? So it's just easier. So your intestines, they go, you know, there's there's like 10 meters of intestines in your body. It's like 30 feet. And so it's all wiggly around. So it's much easier to insert the tube into the stomach, which is a nice big balloon, and then have the pigtail go into the jejunum. So technically it's much easier to do it that way. Uh, than to, then it would have to be like an open surgery to find out where everybody's intestine is. So that's why, and it's basically the same procedure as putting a feeding tube uh, so it's the same tube, it's the same procedure. And basically what it is, it's like going, getting a colonoscopy, it's under fluoroscopy, you know, it lasts about 20, 30 minutes. And the only difference is that you wake up with the tube instead of uh, nothing. Is there a downside to Duopa? So the only downside is that you have to carry the pump. The pump does weigh a pound. Uh, and that you have to flush the tubing every day. So you have to maintain the tubing and maintain the stoma clean and dry. Uh, but other than that, like most of the patients, you know, they're very reluctant to consider Duopa because of the PEG-J. Like right now, when I give patients the option, we can do Duopa or DBS, nine times out of 10, they're still choosing DBS, even though DBS is an invasive brain surgery that's permanent. Uh, and as a clinician, we would choose the reversible option that's not invasive uh, or less invasive, uh, but because the patients are more familiar with DBS, there's nothing hanging out, they know patients in their support group with D DBS, they don't know anybody with Duopa, there's very few takers for Duopa right now. Uh, but I think in the future, as the sub-Q pumps come out, we'll, more people will say yes to a pump and have this more continuous infusion or continuous dopamine tone and instead of having these fluctuations. Uh, somebody did ask about your thoughts on the subcutaneous delivery system. Yep. So that's what we'll talk about next. Oh, and then patients ask, like, well, how do I carry this? And so most people use these belts or these little hip packs. This, you know, this is also common, but, you know, in Arizona, it's just too hot to wear in the summer. And then there is a bra that you can get on Amazon that it's actually made for chemo patients. It has a, it has a pocket. And so patients use that a lot. You can wear a dress without any problems. And so what does the future look like? So actually by this time next year. Can I back up real quick, real quick? Yep. Um, somebody uh -huh. wants to know, is it, does this affect your physical activity? Is it hard to basically go fishing or boating or any nope. swimming? With so you can, that? yeah. So you can do all of those things. So let's say um, I had a patient today asking, 
uh, about swimming. They wanted to go snorkeling. Um, so all you do is you disconnect from the pump. It has a little cap. You can go, you can have, ba you can bathe, you can swim, you can snorkel. Uh, you can go to your rock steady boxing class, your yoga class. If you're off the pump more than two hours, we usually give you a dose of cinnamon. If you're off the pump less than two hours, you usually don't need any medicine, but it's, you know, very user friendly. So if you wanted to take it off, then you can, uh, and you can just put it on wh when you want to again. So you just, you just cap it off. What other, what other, you know, if you wanted to be, play golf and take it off, that would be fine. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, a couple of just quick ones sure. about somebody asked real quick, are two Ritari 95s the same delivery timing as one Ritari 195? So the, the 90, so the 95s would be a little bit less. So the nice thing about Ritari is that you can make any combination of the medicine and that if, let's say you ended up on three of the 95s, then I can lower your pill burden by using two of the 145s. So it just gives us more flexibility. And remember, it's not the number of pills that we're going to reduce by taking Ritari, it's the number of times that we're going to take the medicine. So the number of peaks and, and troughs or those fluctuations that we're going to have, we're going to minimize that by switching over to Ritari. The other thing to know about Ritari is that if you get started early on, so let's say you, you, you started right away on Ritari, then it's super easy to titrate up. If you were switched over from Cinnamon, then there's a period of adjustment or titration. And so that you will have to talk to your neurologist in that first week, second week to make sure that your dose is just right because we're gonna pick a dose. Remember, it's not a one-to-one -one conversion and we're gonna to have to go up or down on your dose until we get the Goldilocks dose, until we get your dose right. Once we get your dose right, you're gonna notice that it, take, it lasts longer, but it's a period of titration or adjustment. So it's not something that happens right away. You need to stick with it and talk to your neurologist about it. And last, are the side effects for Ritari the same as Cinemet? Yeah, so the side effects for Ritari, Cinemet, and these pumps are all the same as Cinemet because it's the same medicine, except for apomorphine, we'll talk about that. But it's the same dopamine. So dopamine, more dopamine makes your motor symptoms better. More dopamine can make your non-motor symptoms worse. It makes you nauseous. It makes you hallucinate, makes you compulsive. It can lower your blood pressure. And that's why our job is to get the dose just right so that we have enough meds on board that you're mobile, but not so much that you're fainting every time you stand up or you're feeling nauseous or you're hallucinating. What other questions? Last one, and then we'll move on because people are asking about what the new stuff looks like. But oh, if you're okay. on Ritari, can you still take Cinnamon occasionally? Yes. So if you're on Ritari, you can still take Cinnamon occasionally. Many patients find that the Ritari has a slow start and they like that jump start of yellow Cinnamon. So they'll take a half or a full dose of Cinnamon with their dose of Ritari. Uh, that's fine. You can take your, that's, uh, it's the same medicine and the same thing. You can be on Duopa and take some Cinnamon or Ritari. Uh, you can mix and match, especially if you're using it at night. And so then, so what's coming in the, oh, go ahead. Is there another question? No, I was just saying, thank you. Oh, okay. And so what's happening next? So next year is going to be super exciting because we're going to get tons of new medicine. So like we said, we'll have IPX203, if it's approved by the FDA, a longer acting form of Ritari. We're going to have three new pumps if they're all approved by the FDA. So two levodopa pumps. So AVI will have 951, which will be a levodopa pump. Neuroderm has also come out with a, a levodopa pump. And then apomorphine, the Supernus, will come out with an apomorphine pump. So this pump has been available in Europe for about 20 years. It's been very successful there. And so these are sub-Q pumps. So instead of putting a PEG-J, having that you know, tube that goes right into the stomach. This is sub-Q, just like your type one insulin pump. It's attached to the skin, it has a little cannula and it's absorbed, the medicine is absorbed through the skin. 
and then here's the medicine here's the same thing it's a vial that's kept in the fridge and then you fill up the syringe and then slowly over the 24-hour period the duopa today is only approved in the f in the us for 16 hours although half of my clinic is on at 24 hours and but these pumps will all be approved for 24 hours and then slowly over the 24 hours you're having the delivery of medicine just like it is for a type 1 diabetic with insulin it's a little bit bigger because levodopa is not as compact as insulin uh, but that, and then you'll see that the pump is much smaller than the old Duopa 1980s pump <laughs> and much easier to use. And so this is the cannula. This is, and then basically you would just replace this, you know, this, this little vial and this um, every day. And you just move it around the umbilicus so that the same little spot, just like patients were on, on Nupro, notice it kind of gets red and irritated. So we want to move it around so the same little patch of skin doesn't get too red or irritated and we move it around your umbilicus. And then here's neuroderm, uh, and it's basically the same kind of thing. And then if you're on it 24 days, some people might need two pump, uh, two vials. And then 951, they're super secretive, so they won't let us have a, a picture uh, of what it looks like. But hopefully all of these, if they're approved by the FDA, these are the things that we have to look forward to uh, next year. And by this time next year, they should all be on the market. And then what are the rescue medicines that we use? So the on-demand therapies. So now we know that all the end-of-mind therapies, they all bypass the gut because remember the gut doesn't work in Parkinson's disease. It gets constipated, it gets slowed up. And so we have three different medicines that bypass the gut to get you on as quickly as possible. So Embresia is an inhaled form of levodopa. And basically you inhale it through the lungs and it goes lungs to brain and gives you a quick on. So in five to 10 minutes, it should start to work and it lasts about an hour. Uh, and you can take it up to five times a day. So we're bypassing the gut. So many patients take this when they run out when they're doing rock steady boxing or first thing in the morning when they're off with their first dose of Ritari, they'll take the Ambresia and get a quick on. Because you're taking this through the lungs, so it's like smoking. So initially, when you start to take Ambresia, if you were not a smoker, you're gonna cough all of this powder out. And it'll last about a week or two until your lungs get used to it. So we want you to take a small little sip of water and then slow and steady. And then after a while, you get, you'll get you be able to absorb the powder without coughing it out and get a good on. And then a dose, a full dose, here's two of these capsules, just not one, it's two of these. So that's how Embresia works. Then Kenobi, so then there's apomorphine, which is a dopamine agonist. Uh, it'll be the same thing as this pump here. Apomorphine is a dopamine agonist. Remember, uh, apomorphine or dopamine agonist are they go and they sit on the same receptors as dopamine but chemically they're not the same chemical and so we can take it as um, kinmobi which is a film that goes under the tongue or as apokin which is an injection or there'll be the apomorphine pump so kinmobi um, comes in different milligrams and we have to titrate you up until you feel a, a full on so we'll start at 10 milligrams and then gradually go up until you say, oh yeah, this dose is working for me. I feel like I have a good on, like my medicine is working. And what we wanna watch out for is patients may have nausea. You may need to take Tigan or a nausea medicine, which is very difficult to get now in the US. People who live on the border uh, with Mexico, they can just cross the border and get Tigan for like $14. Uh, but otherwise it's very difficult to get here in the US. And, um, and we need to monitor your blood pressure because we wanna make sure it doesn't get too low. So that's Kenmobi, and so you just put it under the tongue, same thing as in Brigitte. it kicks in in five to 10 minutes, lasts about an hour, and you can take it up to five times a day. And then there's Apokin, that's like an EpiPen, uh, it uses the same apomorphine, but you know because it's an, uh, an injection, it's gonna kick in faster and you'll get the full dose. You're not, not gonna cough out all of that powder and get, get only half the dose. Uh, but you know it's the least popular because nobody likes this little needle, but it's a very small 29 gauge uh, needle, just like what uh, diabetics use for their insulin. And same thing, we titrate from a low dose until you get your full on. And same thing as the Kinmobi, we need to monitor your blood pressure and make sure you don't get too nauseous. And um, that's another option for us. So again, you can take it up to five times a day. And then there's DBS or deep brain stimulation, uh, which helps us, especially with tremor and dyspnea. I interrupt real quick, I'm sorry. Yeah, go I ahead. 
couple of questions on um, with you expect the side effects of the apomorphine pump to be the same for a patient of those with Camobi sublingual? Yeah, so apomorphine, um, it's the same side effect profile it, with the dopamine agonist. We need to worry a little bit more about compulsive behavior and excessive daytime sleepiness. So uh, those are the things that we, that's why your doctor asks you, are you falling asleep at stop signs or stop lights? Uh, that's why we're taking your blood pressure sitting and standing when you come into the office. Uh, and if you have a lot of nausea, nausea, we can treat that with Tigan. And then also if somebody got a skin rash using the Apican injection years ago, would the apomorphine pump be safe to use? We'd have to try. So we know that with the sub-Q pumps up to, you know, I don't know if it's almost 20% of those patients that get some kind of skin irritation, some redness, some erythema, and then you can get these granulomas or little nodules, just like you would get with insulin. And so that's why you want to move it around so that the same little patch of skin doesn't get too irritated. So we would just have to see how well you tolerate it. And, um, and just make sure it doesn't get infected and that sort of thing and that you tolerate it. Um, and, and if you don't like it, the nice thing about the sub is you just don't put it on, you know, don't put that little Band-Aid on the next day. It's totally reversible, much more reversible than Duopa. So something patients can try, just like the Nupro patch, you can try it if it get, get made it, if you were super itchy and it was red and irritated, then we don't, you know, keep using the patch, we try something else. So the same thing will be true for the sub-Q pumps. And the granulomas are uh, side effects of all of the pumps, except Duopa. So I think more patients will actually end up on Duopa next year than before, because once you're on a continuous dopamine tone, you're not gonna wanna go back on pills and be off every three hours. And so patients were very reluctant to be like, ah, you know, I don't really want that peg J and they forgot what it was to, to feel on all day and to be able to get dressed and bathe in 20 and 30 minutes instead of two hours. Uh, they're gonna choose Duopa if for some reason the sub Q pump didn't work. So DBS is a, a surgical option for us that helps us dial out the tremor. So patients who we can't control the tremor with medications and patients who have on time with dyskinesia. So every time you take a dose of medicine, you become dyskinetic. Then DBS allows us to have you take the medicine without the dyskinesia. So let's see, here's a patient with tremor. So that's another thing, patients, you know, they don't understand what on and off is, what's the difference between tremor and dyskinesia. So here's a patient with tremor. <clears throat> and we can see, the, so the tremor is fast and rhythmic, and it's the same movement over and over again. That's what tremor is. Whereas dyskinesia, it's random movements. And we're gonna, this is the old, <laughs> this is the old Medtronics. We don't use, we don't have to tape it to your, to your um, shirt anymore, it's all done by Bluetooth. And we'll see as she slowly increases the stimulation, we're gonna see that she's able to dial out this tremor. And see, it's nice and quiet now. So nice and quiet. And so there she's saying it's one and a half volts. So that's very low stimulation. So that's what tremor in Parkinson's looks like and what DBS looks like. And here's a patient, Claire, who has dyskinetic movements.
So you can see the movements are random all over the place. So usually that it, Claire's having a honey, honey, a honeymoon period. So usually we turn on your stimulator four weeks later and then start to program it from there. And that can take weeks to months to program. So, but many times with the swelling in the brain, you can have a honeymoon period where you have a good response. And so why was it important to treat your off periods? So we want to minimize the motor fluctuations that you have during the day so that you're not planning your day around your doses of medicines and you're wearing off and you're more, you have more predictability in your day. So you're more likely to plan stuff and do stuff with your friends and family. Um, and then we know that that lack of predictability is what leads to social isolation in patients' lives and uh, leads to depression and anxiety, and then also contributes to um, caregiver burden. Um, so, and I think we're sort of at the top of the hour. So then, because uh, then the, the rest of this talk is about exercise. So currently, you know, the medical and surgic, surgical treatments are purely symptomatic. They don't stop or reverse the disease. Um, and so that we know that the only thing that does that is physical exercise. But we went through these slides last month, um, and I think we're at the top of the hour. So any last minute questions? Yes. Is there an age limit for doing DBS surgery? So I, not necessarily. So it's more your functional age rather than your chronological age. So, I mean, we're a little bit more careful in the 80 year old plus uh, population because they're, they're more likely to have a little bit of confusion or delirium from the anesthesia. But as long as you're a good surgical candidate, um, then we're going to do DBS. So you can be under anesthesia, you can be intubated, and we think that you're going to have a good response, like a reduction in tremor or dyskinesia, um, then we go ahead and do it. If you have dementia, it's the reason why we do neuropsych testing, then that would be a reason not to do DBS, but you would still be eligible to do Duopa or one of the sub Q pumps. And does having a pacemaker preclude DBS? No, it does not. So you can have a pacemaker and DBS uh, and that works fine. Can you also have DBS and Duopa? Yeah, so actually the best, uh, you know, we've got several Duopa um, DBS patients and they do the best because they have continuous therapy in the 24 hours. Remember, your brain talks to itself both chemically, that's how the levodopa works, and then electrically, which is how DBS work. So if you have continuous dopamine tone, you're not pulsing the brain with uh, medicines every three or four hours, those patients have less fluctuations and they do very well. So our DBS duopa combinations do really well. I think our, <clears throat> our sub-Q pumps and DBS uh, populations is going to do well. And then the other thing that's nice about the pumps is that we can go back to monotherapy. You don't have to be on three or four Parkinson's agents. We can just be on the pump and maybe a dopamine agonist like Nupro for restless legs and minimize your medication burden and therefore your side effect burden. And the other thing that's nice about the pumps is that they come out of your Medicare A and B, not Part D. So your financial burden is a lot less. Anybody who's on these medicines know that they're all branded. They're all extremely expensive. If you don't have a grant from PAN or TAF or one of these foundations, it's almost unaffordable to be on three or four PD medicines. So both DBS and the pumps are covered by A and B. Can you briefly discuss focused ultrasound and DBS? Yeah so, yeah, so the difference between focused ultrasound and DBS, so DBS, the pluses of DBS is that it's bilateral. We can do both sides and it's programmable so that we can program the stimulator. Even as the disease advances, we can increase your stimulation. Focus, focus ultrasound is only done on one side today. We can't do both sides. And once you have the lesion from focused ultrasound, that's it, we can't change it. So really we use focus ultrasound for patients who have essential tremor. 
So a disease that's not that progressive uh, and that is done on the dominant side. So if you have one side that has a big amplitude tremor that you can't you know, hold a fork or a spoon or a button a shirt with, then we can do it in that. Um, and, and it doesn't matter so much. In patients with Parkinson's disease, the preference is to do uh, DBS because we can do bilateral, you know, both sides of your body have Parkinson's disease and that we can program it and increase the stimulation as the disease progresses. Um, so those are the pluses and minuses. And focus ultrasound is still a surgery. It's not, they're not gonna cut, but they're making a lesion in your brain with the beam, uh, but it's not a surgery the way DBS is. We do have a few medicine questions. Does Can you overdose on your Parkinson's medications? Yep, so you can overdose on your Parkinson's medicine. So, but you know, Parkinson's medicines are very sort of forgiving in a sense, the levodopa, you don't wanna overdose on the other stuff. So too little medicine, you're slow, stiff and rigid. Too much medicine, you can be dyskinetic, you can hallucinate, you'll be nauseous, you'll throw up. Once the pills metabolize, then that goes away, uh, but you know, so you can always play a, a little around with your medicines, but you don't want to take too much of your dopamine agonist or your uh, COMPT inhibitors. You want to be careful with those. Can you take more than five off-time medications such as Kenobi in a day? So usually that is not recommended. So it's, it's approved for five times a day. And then we just want to make sure. So if you're having more than five off periods a day, then that's somebody that we need to consider DBS or a pump for, or use longer acting forms of levodopa like Ritari. So in the future, anybody who takes levodopa more than four times a day would be offered a pump. Like, why are you going to take a medicine five, six, seven, eight times a day? Why are you going to be off five times a day? You're going to have a much better quality of life getting on a pump. And then we do have a couple of questions about people with diabetes dealing with less carbs and more protein. How do you divide the protein correctly? Um, so many to coordinate a rescue dose. Yeah, so many, so you can use the rescue dose because remember the rescue dose bypasses the gut. So it doesn't matter what you ate or when you ate it. And then many times we'll just yeah, program your protein at bedtime or at night. Uh, but again, if we use a pump, then we don't have to worry about what you're eating or when you're eating it. Uh, and we, there's less to worry about during the day. Okay. And then I do have, because this comes up a lot. If you're on vacation and you're in a time zone that is four hours difference, do you continue taking the cinemat based on the home time schedule or do you adjust to the local time? And if so you, you adjust, adjust to your gradually or what do you do? So you are just to your body. Remember, it's your body that has the Parkinson's disease, not, not the clock. So you're adjusting to your body when your body is wearing off and your sleep-wake schedule. Mm -hmm. And is uh, there any medicine that slows down the progression of PD? Yeah, so there isn't any medicine that slows down the progression of PD. It, the only thing that we know of so far is aerobic exercise, the one that gets the heart rate up. And if you've taken too much levodopa, is there anything that can bring you down? So no, you have to wait until the pills metabolized uh, for that dyskinesia or those side effects to go away. The nice thing about the pump is that you can turn the pump off and then you know, 20 minutes later, it's all gone. Remember the pump gives you a little infusion of levodopa every 57 seconds. So you have much more control over your dose than if you take a pill. Once you swallow that pill, we don't know when it's going to kick in and how long it's going to last, and we certainly can't get it back. So the best control over your medicine is one of the pumps. And then, is there an objective test to determine the correct dose? Because sometimes symptoms changes can be subtle. Right. So unlike diabetics who, you know, they have their continuous glucose monitors or they have their finger stick, uh, you know, we don't know, we don't have one of those for levodopa doses, so we have to do it all on symptoms, and that's why we want you to learn how to read your body and figure out when your non-motor symptoms are coming up before the motor symptoms. Do you have a suggested schedule for cinnamon to start no, with? Ev everybody is different, so it's very individualized. And I just really want to thank you for your time. Okay, great. Thank you. This has been lovely. Obviously, we do have our PMD tradition where we do the wave of gratitude because we were so grateful for this presentation. Thank you so much for your time today. Sure. Um,
And this will all be available tomorrow if you go on our website, pmgalliance.org. And you can look it up and you can see the slides and you will have access to this program again. Thanks everybody. Okay, for take care us. you guys. Bye-bye.